Well, summer came and went, and we went back to winter. So the world has gone crazy, the weather has gone crazy, uh, in case you didn't notice. Um, and this poor chap, the ancient underground watercourse uh, filled up with silt with the rains we've been having. And he had to risk his life trying to dig out all the mud uh, from under this road before he was probably flooded. So he was up to his boots in this digger um, trying to dig out uh, the watercourse. And he only just made it before the rains came. And well, I hope he made it. I didn't see the end of that story. But anyway, um, getting back now and uh, just having a recap on the ground we've covered. So yeah, we were talking about Thanatos and the death wish of the alien cortex when it's cornered, which I warned you about. Um, and so I want to tell you about an alternative to that. So that's what I think I promised you in the last videos uh, in this one, to try and share with you a philosophy that I think is superior to the one that you are likely to go out on if you've never if you don't know that there is anything different if you don't know about the alien cortex if you're just um, really going through the motions so yeah let me share you uh, share with you my philosophy and you see what you think but uh, first of all yeah let me share with you how I came uh, about this philosophy now you remember I mentioned before that I was in this cult um, and I really left it because I realized uh, that the ultimate aim of the cult was spiritual development but after spiritual development, after enlightenment, really they were world-hating, nihilistic and there was only one place to go from there and they said well you reach realization and then as soon as you reach realization which was supposed to be the big deal um, you have a realization experience um, really a dramatic experience I, I know a lot of gurus and spiritual teachers and they don't know what they're doing in fact 99 percent of them don't know what they're doing and one of the key um, factors if you if you do have a spiritual guru and you want to know if they know their stuff is just ask them is self-realization is that uh, a dramatic moment or does it happen gradually if they say it happens gradually they don't know what they're talking about I would run so yeah a very very dramatic it's basically a psychotic breakdown that happens and that's realization and that's what all these uh, mis mystic and esoteric uh, schools are teaching is how to reach this point uh, that breakdown is the death of your alien cortex in effect it's the death of your ego so yeah it, it um, shouldn't take too long to get there you know, under proper guidance and study um, yeah it took me about five years and when that happened they turned around and told me yeah you're a bit of a dumbass because it should have taken you only about two years so yeah kind of a big shock because everybody thought oh it'll take you a hundred lifetimes to reach realization and the Buddha is realizing it's like nah 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 two years that's all it takes under proper guidance and supervision um, but yeah I am a bit of a thicky and it took me about five years and then they immediately after you have that experience they immediately um, yeah it's called Makyo it's um, really going off track so the very big danger after realization that they downplay it so they tell you yeah that's just the first step that's nothing um, and then the big thing is full realization so that's realization and then full realization is the thing now I started to realize gradually that full realization meant giving up the world it meant dying in essence, if you look at Socrates, it, it's a kind of a suicide because after realization, you have, uh, it's hard to say that you have control, but you really are in this kind of synchronistic mesh with, uh, with the world. And you can vaguely 
steer it, though I think that's probably sounding too authoritarian. But in essence, uh, the, the world tends to move where you want, where you will it, where you wish it. Where you, that needs qualification because before realization you have all these weird wishes and desires and all these things and those never come true. It's a, this is not the secret, by the way. It's not that book. Um, these the wishes your wishes are entirely in tune with what happens anyway. So it's debatable to say whether you know you whatever happens you wish it and whatever you wish happens. So it's kind of like you're just going with the flow. Um, kind of difficult to describe but there is an element of steering in it because after self-realization then the assumption is you will want full realization and then the assumption um, is certainly in this cult that I was in and I think in Hindu philosophy in general is that you will desire um, to leave the movie theater to to die um, so, yeah, very nihilistic, and I thought, as I mentioned before, that there's something wrong with this picture, and it really started me on the road to questioning what's going on and um, go deeper into philosophy. So, yeah, I think everybody is kind of at that point once they become a realist and, and decide that the human race is probably going extinct. And once you... Once you fully accept that and have gone through the grieving process, which never really leaves you, I mean, there's always, always a kind of punch in the stomach again and again when you, when you realize how close it is and how real it is. So that never goes away. Um, but after the initial shock uh, and grief, um, then it's interesting to see where people go, but in general they seem to go into a kind of limbo. They, if you look on things like the Collapse Wiki and Reddit, um, there's a, a big theme where people kind of say, well, I didn't really like humanity anyway, and it's probably better that it went extinct. It's kind of a life-hating life misanthropy. Um, and so they say, yeah, it's probably, there's a, a large portion of people that think, yeah, it's probably a good thing that we go extinct. There's another group of people that's, that say, well, yeah, I mean, uh, who, who cares? We're all going to die anyway. And I'm just going to, you know, crack open a beer and watch it on TV. Well, you're not. Neither of these are philosophies I agree with um, at all. Uh, you're not going to crack open a beer and watch the apocalypse on TV, I'm afraid. Um, basically, we're all in this together. Um, at some point, TV's going to go out. The grid's going to go out. Uh, long before that, a beer is probably going to cost more than a month's wages. Um, yeah, I don't think you're going to be watching this one on TV w drinking a beer. That is not really going to happen. Um, unless, uh, you know, you watch a few uh, bits of disaster porn and commit suicide and you might as well do that now if that's your thinking. Um, so I don't agree with that one. Then there's, you know, well, your response might be, well, we might as well party till we drop. And that's um, a hedonistic viewpoint. And you can see these people really are going through and picking a philosophy of life. So all the philosophies of life you could possibly think of, no one's ever thought of anything more than they came up with in ancient Greece. So they had the complete catalogue of attitudes to life. Um, you know, you don't need to go to Jordan Peterson uh, to get your philosophy of life. All he's doing is stoicism. So you can go and look what the Stoics said and cut out the middleman. Um, so. Uh, yeah, hedonism is a viewpoint. Um, Epicureanism uh, that you know you in, enjoy all the good things while you can. Each one of these philosophies, you will see in abundance uh, if you go onto Reddit uh, and see realists on the collapse um, subreddit talking about collapse and the fact that we're going extinct. And you'll find each each person ta adopting one of these philosophies from ancient Greece that were exhausted in those times and argued to death in those times. So it's well worth going back and seeing what the ancient Greeks said because it was all done and dusted um, in that era. 
and you don't have to rediscover them, although everybody does. There's Jordan Peterson rediscovering Stoicism. <laughs> it's like rather, rather hilarious, really. Um, but um, yeah, all these people have various stages of ignorance, and then you don't have to be ignorant. You can go and read up on whatever you whatever you think. You think, well, now I'm just going to party till I drop. We'll go and look at hedonism, hedonism, and it's. Um, it's all been discussed out and where that leads to and you can't add much or take much away from what they've already said so yeah um, so then what is a good philosophy to pick and well I have a very unusual take on this one because what I realized was all these philosophies, they all come from your alien cortex. They're all your alien cortex a way of rationalizing itself and the world. So they generally tend to fall into a couple of categories. If you choose to be religious, say you go by one of the god-awful three books of the alien cortex or or Hindu philosophy, something from the East, you'll find that in general they also fo following this life-hating um, nihilistic path. So, yeah, so I, I won't really bore you with, um, you know, Soren Kierkegaard or, or Nietzsche or uh, any of those, but except to say, you know, that um, say Nietzsche's was talking about existentialism and how to deal with existentialism and how to deal with depression in the face of the fact that we are going extinct. So there's nothing new really under the sun and when you realize that well everybody was going to die anyway the only thing new is we we're not going to have any legacy so but it was always that way. So one of the great stages of development is to realize that Anything you do in life, stone and oak decays and it gives no stay. You can't do anything in this life that is permanent. So any will towards fame, any will towards eternal recognition, immortality through works um, is really just your alien cortex and it's, it's really a kind of a disease. And it's, a, it's really a, a terrible disease because it it's fatal. It's uh, pathological and fatal as you can now see. So that's that's the new information that we're getting by knowing that we're probably going extinct from catastrophic and abrupt climate change is that it, it means that all our illusions of continuity are going away. So that actually assists you in realization and personal development because that's the key insights that really drives the initial study on any kind of uh, spiritual path. So it, it says in the Veda, I think, that um, that Nachiketas, in, yeah, I think the, the Rig Veda, um, or yeah, th I think uh, the Kata Upanishad actually, starts off with uh, um, Nachiketas, uh, who is fearing uh, Yama, which is death. <laughs> so, so he's, um, that's the beginning of spiritual inquiry is you finally accept that you're going to die and then you ask well what's this all about and now many people are being distracted out of the you know really mundane quotidian lives um, meaningless lives in on this capitalist treadmill and then asking now if we are going extinct what was it all about why 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 did our species exist? Why go through all this pain and agony, all this storm in a teacup? Um, what was it all for? What's the purpose? And then there are various answers in philosophy uh, that go back to the dawn of time. Um, so, yeah. So, if you go with the alien cortex, as I said, that it once it's cornered, it realizes it's trapped, there's no way out, there's no solution to our extinction, and there's no solution to our personal death, then, yeah, that's really quite a gift, because it's from that kind of, um, it, if you can work that out of your system through catharsis, that's, uh, or rather the next stage, which is incubation, you really have to mull over this. You don't have to... Um, go into this rumination 
on climate change and extinction, that kind of rumination can become a kind of addiction. So, yeah. As Gautier says, you know, in the song. You can get addicted to a certain kind of sadness. So anyway, we... I don't think it's a good use of your remaining time to ruminate on the end times and it's a kind of a low-grade poison to get addicted to uh, disaster porn and trying to you know reaffirm every time you the sun shines and the world looks wonderful uh, you kind of pinch yourself and think maybe we're not going extinct after all and then you find yourself going back and uh, looking at disaster porn and all these these kind of nihilistic uh, websites and reaffirming that yeah this probably is true um, so that you can get in your kind of down state again and that down state has, has a low grade kind of satisfaction so it is a kind of a low grade addiction it's kind of like a, a cheap drug um, so I don't recommend going out with that um, but what do I recommend um, so yeah certainly I recommend getting over all this nihilistic stuff and basically going beyond your alien cortex so the alien cortex has killed us and the very last thing you can do is kill it back in other people and in yourself so uh, yeah revenge revenge is good uh, they I know you're a slave and they told you revenge is bad but that's just so they can keep the slave uh, plantation running revenge is good um, revenge is good don't underestimate it but anyway the, this this life hating thing is permeates all these religions and I started to realize that um, as soon as I uh, you know that story of Socrates that I told you when I realized that when he died not only is he committing suicide a big no-no but he's actually uh, relishing it because he's saying that life it is is a disease and he's recovering from it if you remember that so yeah, that's all over the place here. It's, uh, in, in John 12, 25, for example, it says, Whoever loves his life will lose it, but whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. So in other words, there's this bollocks idea that there's some kind of heaven there where your alien cortex can go up to um, and, uh, in, and exist there um, untouched. It's uh, the same idea in... Um, uh, you know Plato's allegory of the cave so in the allegory of the cave Plato's saying that we all chained like prisoners it's really the alien cortex saying we all chained like prisoners facing ahead it's basically the ancient Greek version of a movie theater um, or virtual reality simulation so he's saying we all in this virtual reality simulation and then everything we perceive through our senses is kind of a shadow of some real thing and the real thing is the abstract world the world of our alien cortex full of symbolism uh, full of abstract ideas and so Socrates is saying in the allegory of the cave is that oh yeah his um, platonic forms all the ideal forms um, are almost mathematical inviolate pure um, and everything else is just a rough approximation. The, the whole world is just trying to roughly approximate all these divine things that the alien cortex has in its head. Complete nonsense, of course, because it's Cartesian dualism. So what, what, what it is is the mind-body dualism. It's saying, I have a mind, alien cortex, and I have a body, and it has senses, the rest of the brain, the older layers of the brain, and they're feeding me information, and I don't believe it, I don't like it, it's pleasure and pain, and I want to go beyond that. And then it commits suicide, saying like, I don't need my body, I can ex exist without it. A complete horseshit, it's insanity squared, but that's where our alien cortex is, and it still lives with us, even in the materialist world. You get these idiots that say, well, I could be uploaded to silicon. I, meaning alien cortex, gets uploaded to silicon. Silicon, of course, being its brainchild. And the assumption is all you are is an alien cortex. You don't have feelings, emotion, flight or flight reactions. You don't have love. You don't have empathy. You, you don't actually breathe. Um, you don't 
basically taste or have any senses you're just an alien cortex and you're just doing computing you're just in this mathematical realm and that's a very very strong impetus for the alien cortex and it's in the our tradition in the west is riddled with this disease um, so you have it in aristotle you have it in um, in in so with socrates this idea that you have this spirit that is your intellect that is going to survive the death of the body um, <clears throat> a crazy crazy notion and um, and deadly it's got to keep Cartesian du dualism as I said and then what he's saying is you know um, je pense donc je suis I think therefore I am so that's pure alien cortex the alien cortex things thinking is being but of course it's really je suis donc je pense means that I exist and if I exist, I compute, I, I think, is, is the better way to, to, to think about it and think of it in terms of um, biology and materialism. And that's uh, the better way to go. So, yeah, um, Pythagoras, too, was completely saturated in this idea that everything is numbers, everything is geometry, it's, um, and, um, yeah, you, you get it again and again coming down. So even, like, Bertrand Russell, he's, he's a mathematician, another mathematician um, in recent times, very involved in logical positivism and this idea well you know the whole world can be better managed by silicon and you still get it now in the venus project and the zeitgeist peter joseph with all this nonsense about how you can have this managed resource economy and it's all managed by computers with you know loving grace <laughs> there's a great um great video by Alan, Adam Curtis um, called Machines of Loving Grace and there's this idea that our alien cortex uh, which is kind of hampered by the rest of our body and our feelings and it's you know a lot of interference and noise in our head but we can if we can just put our alien cortex in silicon it can manage everything because computers uh, are not subject to all this interference from you know the rest of the brain layers so utter, utter madness but um, yeah, I just I quote you something from uh, Bertrand Russell. So he said, I like mathematics because it's not human and has nothing particular to do with this planet or with the whole accidental universe. Because, like Spinoza's God, it won't love us in return. Thank God for that, you know, basically he's saying, you know, it would be terrible if, you know, <laughs> if a authoritarian psychopath like God actually loved us it's much better that he leaves us alone um, so I agree with him on that point what I what what he doesn't understand is that it's his alien cortex talking it's alien cortex who's in love with uh, mathematics particularly with mathematicians like Paul Erdős and that they only like numbers because of the purity um, and the sanctity and I must come back to that mathematical point because it's a complete lie it's a complete um, Inversion, and it was, you know, um, Kurt Gödel, Alan Turing. They proved it mathematically. So, so, um, yeah, um, and it's uh, yeah, this life-hating thing, and uh, where people go to. Um, yeah, so, yeah, um, I'll give you an example that in in the cult um, that uh, really kind of shocked me. Or also after I had this kind of epiphany with with Socrates, but. In the cult, they were all about presence of mind and being in the moment. So when we had meals, group meals, and um, it was really very, very nice. I really, um, I, I'm very fond, very fond memories of, of the, those times. Um, may, but mainly because you, you got a lot of meaning to life, dopamine, um, or serotonin, all these chemicals, um, really oxytocin all these things which you kind of often lack in our individualist western life you got them in this communal um, living arrangement so yeah it was very very nice from from that point of view um, it, but I had a real awakening there um, uh, because a lot of the impetus in, is on being in the present moment so now it's called mindfulness and mindfulness training and it's about um, staying present and 
really grounding your alien cortex so it's not in running away in this abstract virtual reality world. It's connected to your senses and hence to the real world and grounded in it. And then there's much satisfaction to life in that. So we often did things like that. My guru would ask, you know, after a meal or something, what that was like having the meal, um, kind of like psychotherapy. Um, and everybody, you know, what, what he's really asking is, did you have your attention on tasting and um, as you ate and things like that? Uh, and of course, everybody's doing the normal primate brain thing and trying to give the right answers and be good children in the class. And so they'd always say, oh, you know, they'd come up with these offer all these insights into, oh, I really tasted my food and it was all, yeah, it was rather wonderful to experience that and blah, 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 blah. And this uh, went on for years. And we all got the idea that really that wasn't the answer, the right answer. That wasn't the answer that the guru was, was looking for. And eventually somebody just came out and said after years of this kind of practice just said the truth and he just got pissed off and said look I know everybody says oh it was wonderful and I tasted it and he said like I tasted it and you know what it tasted like nothing it tasted like nothing it tasted like ash and suddenly my guru erupted into joy and he said finally finally somebody told the truth after all these years, after all these years now, one person stood up and told the truth and everybody was kind of shocked because they thought it was all this carey, sherry, pink cloud and uh, it was, you know, like the, what would happen if you, if you go into an ashram or you go into one, a, any one of these spiritual retreats and you get all floozy about um, how wonderful the experience is. And so, yes, it was a complete shock that the Guru said, like, exactly what he said, it tasted like nothing, it was said, finally some progress with this group. And that bothered me a lot. I had to say I knew exactly what this person was talking about, is that if you do taste your food enough, eventually you will lose your appetite for it. In, in other words, you you stop having this um, really worship of food that we have in our culture and you start once you really taste it and taste it enough um, it will dampen down and eventually to tell the truth you can't taste it so yeah put that in your uh, fabulous I'm spiritual you know new age realm um, that is the truth if you if you pursue it enough you'll find that uh, it tastes like ash so why is that progress for the group because it's all about renunciation it's all about detachment and letting go so really you can only have the self-realization and uh, realizational experience when your alien cortis, cortex detaches what that self-realizational experience is is pure solipsism so it's pure solipsism in the alien cortex the alien cortex thinks of the world as an addendum as a virtual reality as in the Hindu philosophy they call it um, uh, they call it Maya the, the grand illusion uh, it comes from Maya comes from Ma is the Sanskrit root Ma which is mother and so it's it's considered the earth mother Gaia uh, the prima mater, uh, the the prime mother, uh, she's fooling your alien cortex, like uh, Descartes, the question that he was worried about leading up to, um, I think therefore I am, was he was saying maybe I'm a, a brain in a vat, maybe this is all virtual reality, and a demon is fooling my brain into thinking that there is this world. It's the Matrix movie, okay? So he's saying maybe the Matrix movie is just computer generated. This horseshit, horseshit idea that comes up again and again and comes up in scientific papers now. Oh God, these things are peer reviewed. Oh no. Anyway, this horseshit idea that this, you know, the real world, the material world is a virtual reality and our, our alien cortex is real, it's unreal. 
it's um, you know if you if you look at Maya, uh, Maya is called. So let me say it's basically a magic show or theater. So ba uh, some of the translations of Maya: illusion, unreality, deception, fraud, trick, sorcery, witchcraft, and magic. Magic, and this is the magic of the divine mother. So the prima mater. So material, the materialist point of view, which is our Western scientific rationalist point of view is that the world is made of material that comes from the root word ma, mata, and so it's mother, material, they are this lila, it is um, basically maya fooling our brains is what they're saying. So the idea is that you, you're having this dream, so your alien cortex is having a dream of uh, reality and it's it's even it even comes up again in 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 uh, quantum in the quantum observer. So the idea is that the world doesn't ex actually exist until there's a uh, quantum observer. And then you might ask, well, after the Big Bang, how did anything exist? Because there weren't any observers. And then uh, various people have said, oh well, God is observing. And it's like, no, God's your alien cortex. Get over it. Um, so. Uh, yeah, Wheeler said basically, the, the John Wheeler, a famous physicist, said that we, uh, the universe didn't exist. He says that it only came into existence when we started to observe it. So we, its history was manufactured. Now this is also bullshit. It kind of implies that stars only come into existence when you look at them through a telescope. So in other words, everything the Hubble telescope saw in deep space didn't exist before we made the Hubble telescope and then basically we collapsed wave packets to see the light there. It's complete nonsense because basically we're seeing back in time you can't, you know, we can't reconstruct a path of light through space back to uh, prehistory. So yeah, Wheeler, complete kook, um, and everybody else that has this idea that the, the universe doesn't exist. The, ultimately, you have to be a materialist and say, yeah, the alien cortex evolved out of this world and out of, um, you know, natural processes. So God didn't create the universe, the universe created God. So as I mentioned, inverted world, this is all about reinverting it. And you can't argue with that. As soon as you uh, go back and, and look at the history of God and realize God came into existence recently with the alien cortex, not the universe, <laughs> the other way around. But the reason why your alien cortex thinks of it that way is not only because it's a narcissist, but also it implies that it's going to die. It implies that if it just emerges from nature, then it must return to dust. And that's what it doesn't want to do. So that's why, why it's inverted the world as a trick. So the real trick is not Maya, it's not Leela, this big play that's uh, being played against Brahman, the alien cortex. Brahman is the Hindu version of your alien cortex. So it's not your alien cortex in the matrix. Your matrix generates the, ma the alien cortex. So that that's the only thing that makes any sense and after realization where you realize hey my alien cortex is god that's really what realization is then you can either go one of two ways you can go this nihilistic path that people are on um you know it's 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 the it's a very dark path um, and that's the path that I think most people will go on without any knowledge or training or any philosophy like I intend to give you in these videos so it's it's really uh, like Macbeth you know so what they're doing on on reddit people realize that uh, in the collapse subreddit when they think in terms of oh we're screwed. Okay, then they go into exactly what Macbeth was doing, and that's the cornered alien cortex. <laughs> so, yeah, Macbeth, as when he was told that Lady Macbeth had died, in other words, your version of, uh, yeah, the planet is toast, there's nothing we can do about it, then immediately he, he says, Ah, oh, well, that was going to happen anyway, wasn't it? I mean, that's was going to be news I was going to get at some time. And then he says this, the famous speech, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this deadly pace from day to day. 
to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have only lighted fools to a dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life is a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, then is no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. And that's about as nihilistic as you can get. And that's where people go to if they just if they don't know about the alien cortex, they don't know that it's an evolutionary disease, and they don't know that there's anything uh, better. So, so what is the the alternative? And well, uh, the alternative path—that's the one path. So the other path is uh, really to what leads to a death, not by spite, not by. Uh, I think it's a second-rate death, Socrates' death. So it's basically um, a last attempt to keep control. It's the alien cortex's last attempt to keep control, to decide how it dies. It's, it's really Goering taking cyanide capsules um, when he's been condemned to death. Or, you know, any, any one of these examples, many examples where people take their own life because the, the idea of them losing control and having their life taken by somebody else is so abhorrent to your alien cortex that even though uh, it's going to sacrifice a little bit of uh, time, it's fine um, because of it's doing it out of spite against the world, of spite against the matrix, spite against uh, the prima mater. So, yeah, not the way to go. No, definitely not, unless you just basically you want to be an alien cortex and go down as an alien cortex and uh, die with your, with your ego intact. I have a better way. So after I realized that really this, the school and Western, I mean, Eastern philosophies in, in general are really life-hating, um, uh, um, yeah, I started to see this in so many um, of the Western traditions in uh, over and over you get this idea where, um, yep, the world is evil. Um, it's, uh, it's Jesus' gay lover, John, all over again. What he's saying is, you know, if you love your life, you'll lose it. It's only if you hate the life in this world that, you, that you'll get it outside. It's like if you detach yourself and become an alien cortex on its own as an island with this fiction, uh, then, then, um, then you'll have eternal life. And of course, John got eternal life. That's why, you know, you can go and meet him uh, on the street almost any place, right? It's, it's lunacy, just complete lunacy. So... Yeah, I thought, what are the alternatives? And I looked high and low for, for an alternative. And the other great saint almost, the sage that everybody revered in this cult, apart from Socrates, um, another highly revered individual was Shakespeare. And so I thought, okay, well, if Socrates is a bit of a write-off, what about Shakespeare? What's Shakespeare's philosophy? And I spent many, many years um, thinking about what Shakespeare's philosophy is and, and reading it, and I eventually came to the conclusion that he had it. It's about getting rid of your alien cortex. It's basically bringing your alien cortex to heal. In other words, crushing it. So I started to realize that what people have done after self-realization in the normal course of events, um, they tainted by this rationalist point of view, um, this logical positive point of view, the alien cortex is not really dead in them. In fact, they've elevated it to the extreme. What they haven't done after self-realization where you acknowledge yourself as God is you have to ask yourself, well, what's everybody else then? Well, if you do it wrong, then you say, well, they just sense perceptions. They don't really exist. And when I die, they'll all dissolve and go away. So it's an upside down view. Again, the alien cortex is saying, and this is a quote from a number of people who have said similar things is, when I die, I don't really die. It's the world that disappears. But that's horseshit because the world exists and you emerge from it with your alien cortex. So in that point of view, you have to say, well, other people, are not chopped liver. 
they too are conscious and they too have this godlike interior, um, this glassy essence in, in Shakespeare. So that's the first clue of uh, Shakespeare is he's saying the self is not a little homunculus inside you, it's a glassy essence. It's uh, if you try and look inside and perceive it within yourself, you just see glass, it's just transparent. So the Buddhists say, yeah, the void, they see that as the void, and they say, well, that's yourself. Uh, if you are a non-dualist Vedantist, then you say, no, there's only the self. The void is not the self. The self is a kind of homunculus. It is the observer in quantum, the quantum observer, in other words. It means that they haven't quite got rid of their, their ego and their alien cortex. If they did, you have to say that other people exist, they're not chopped liver, they are also God. Right. And then what do you say about philosophy? If that's your philosophy, where do you go from there? What is the proper way of dying? Now you realize that everybody is just, in essence, God. Um, God experiences the world by opening his eyes or her eyes. Um, observing the world, having a little think about it, and then dying. And that is really the only way that God gets to see his creation. Your alien cortex gets to live, in other words. And it's the only way the universe gets to be perceived. Um, there are no observers apart from this evolved alien cortex. Uh, and its equivalents, so I mean in animals, but consciousness, all right? So if that is true, then what philosophy do you adopt and what did Shakespeare say? And I came to the conclusion that he says the ultimate philosophy is no philosophy. Philosophizing is your alien cortex just trying to make sense of the world and it's trying to put it in a box. It's trying to do what it always does. It's try, it tries to lock everything up. It tries to encapsulate everything. It tries to put everything in a cell and that way dominate it and control it. So philosophy is your alien cortex's way of locking up life and putting it in a box. And guess what? It doesn't go in a box. Your alien cortex should go in a box. So that's the use of your alien cortex. The best use you can put it to is locking itself up, putting itself in a box. And that practice of doing that is the practice of what is often called the mirror. So everything your alien cortex wants to do, the universe, you turn on itself. And so through self-reflection, you put yourself in a box. Now, consider this from the point of view of Hinduism. So from the point of view of Hinduism, uh, that they think of in terms of Leela, the dream, the trickery, the sorcery, uh, basically the movie that's all going on. They say that Brahman uh, has this dream. It's not from volition. He didn't wish it. He, he has this dream just automatically. It's just something that just happens. So the world is dreamt into existence. And they say that when he no longer wants it, he can turn inwards and focusing on himself. He withdraws his attention from the world and it goes away. Pure alien cortex. I just put you out of frame and then you don't exist. Classic alien cortex behavior. So I can just put the world out of frame and then it doesn't exist and I carry on existing. Well, of course, that's nonsense. As Socrates discovered, hopefully, before he went lights out, was that, well, he was going away, not the world. So, yeah. Um, so then I stuck with the view that what Shakespeare was saying was he nailed it. Is any philosophy is just the bullshit ramblings, the tale told by an idiot, and that idiot is your alien cortex. So, I, that, that lasted for a long time, um, until about 2007. In about 2007, I had to change my philosophy of life. And the reason is I took a little trip to India, a kind of a pilgrimage to uh, Sri Ramakrishna. Um, uh, so, yeah, don't worry if you don't know who he is. Um, so, I, I was staying at the Ramakrishna Math, or the Math, uh, the, and uh, there are all sorts of scholars and very, very interesting people that stay there. 
And one of the people that was there was uh, a guy called Dr. Data. Uh, he very um, advanced in years. I'm not sure um, he may, or if he if he's alive, he he might be in his hundreds. Um, anyway, um, yeah. So Dr. Data um, was an expert on Shakespeare. So of course, um, as soon as I heard that, I latched on to him, and we had these wonderful discussions. Um, and he's one of these people that, uh, you know, I meet occasionally where it's try as I might, I cannot find uh, anything that I disagree with in their philosophy and, and vice versa. And so, yeah, we discussed Shakespeare and these kind of aspects in great depth for many days um, until one day I found the first thing where we had a severe divergence, in fact the only divergence in our thought um, that, that we had, and that's that I mentioned this, that, you know, I said, I think he asked, you know, the, what my philosophy was li of life was, and I, I, um, I told him that uh, it's the same as Shakespeare's. So he said, what's that? And I said, it's no philosophy. And I was very surprised because he actually cuffed me, hit me round the round the head. We were having this perfectly nice conversation, and he suddenly flared up and walloped me because I said Shakespeare had no philosophy. And he says, he says, you can never say that. Never say that Shakespeare does not have a philosophy. He has a philosophy. And I went, but what? So he says, why do you say that Shakespeare has no philosophy? And I said, well, because after years of looking at it, anything he says, you can see that he negates. He's, the Bible does the same trick. What the Bible is doing is, and this comes as a great shock for Christians, they think that the Bible never contradicts itself. No, it contradicts itself almost symmetrically. It's, it's tailor-made for contradiction. So anything you say in the Bible, I'll find you the paragraph that contradicts it. And that's why it's lasted so long, is that it's, it's like a Jackson Pollock pic, uh, picture or um, a Rossach Inkblock test. So uh, now Rossach in, Inkblock tests are not entirely random. Um, they, they are what I'd call pseudo-random or crypto-random. And the Bible is like that too. It's not entirely random. It doesn't entirely negate itself. Like Shakespeare's plays is whatever... Uh, statement of philosophy, life philosophy, he says, you can find another instance where he negates it and says the exact opposite. And the Bible is exactly the same. Um, what that does in effect is it makes just um, a white noise that then you stare at with your intellect. In other words, your inte intellect looks at it and what it sees is the mirror. It just sees itself. You just see your own biases. So the the Bible is a book for looking up your own biases. And Shakespeare is too. You can do exactly the same thing. You can make any any philosophical point and use him as an authority to make any uh, great point of philosophy. Um, except if you know enough Shakespeare, you can immediately find the negation of any, any point. Now the Bible is not completely random and... Um, just complete white white noise because it's crypto random because it wants you to hate the world ultimately it's written by your alien cortex and it wants you to share the same view the ultimate the what it, it wants confirmation of itself it wants confirmation that your alien cortex is the only thing it exists and the rest of the world is shite and that's the bible's trying to steer you towards that that horrible path i would call it the um, Yahweh's path or the devil's path. It's Satan. That's what Satan wants you to believe. Um, and the big white guy with the white beard, Yahweh, Allah, he's, he's Satan. He's not God. Um, so, you know, he's, that's your alien cortex and it's trying to make you hate the world um, instead of uh, love it. It's just, um, yeah, it's trying to make you nihilistic for the reasons that, that I, I, I said. Now, the point of this is it, it, it makes it like a, a kind of a Jackson Pollock picture. So if you see a Jackson Pollock picture, you'll see that it's cleverly designed to be scale-free. It's dripping paint on the canvas, and your mind is, is scale-free. Scale-free, I mentioned before, but it, it just means that 
the chances of a big splash on Jackson, Jackson Pollock's paintings are uh, in direct proportion to how big the in, inverse proportion to how big the splash is. So in other words, it's like the surface of the moon. If you look at the craters on the moon, um, there are lots of craters of all different sizes, but the frequency of the size is related to the inversely to the size of the crater. So you see a big crater for sure, but very few of them. And the smaller you go, the more you'll see of them. And that's called scale-free. It's called Pareto distribution. It's um, it's very, very common in nature. And what Jackson Pollock is doing is he's dropping paint like that. So when you stare at it, uh, your, your brain and its connectivity is also a scale-free network. And it um, shares this uh, kind of distribution. Um, so it starts to just see its own self. So that's the that's what Jackson Pollock is doing and that's why his, his paintings are so long lasting is because they're a mirror for you to see your own neural apparatus and its own biases. The Bible is also like that and so I thought Shakespeare was and Shakespeare is saying he's trolling us. He's just saying like uh, you know whatever philosophy you think is wrong because it's just comes from the alien cortex and the alien cortex is an abomination. Uh, and then Dr. Data slapped my face for that. And I said to him, isn't that right? Isn't it just what I described to you about uh, having no information? Being information free just r makes you a mirror. So all you see in Shakespeare is yourself. And he said, almost. But Shakespeare did come out and say his ultimate philosophy. And I thought, if he did that, where? And he said, in King Lear. And then that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck, because if he had put his philosophy anywhere, he would have slipped it into King Lear. But I, I've looked at King Lear a lot, and I never found it in there. Um, so I said, I've looked in King Lear. I can't see it. And he said, yes, uh, it's in there. I said, which character? And he said, Edgar. So I thought, okay, King Lear is right. If he's right, if Shakespeare was like one of these old masters that slipped himself in with this little, you know, photo bomb with a little selfie at the back of the picture, it would be a minor character like Edgar. I'll give him that. But I said, I still can't see it. I still can't see see what the what the actual phrase that Edgar said that gives away Shakespeare's philosophy. And I'll read it to you here. It's basically what Dr. Data said was, it's Act 5, Scene 2. Now that's when King Lear is the deposed alien cortex, after realization alien cortex, the destroyed ego. He's between two army camps right in the middle. It's very Zen and the, there's a lot of Zen stories right in the middle. Um, so yeah, this is the right territory. We, we have five seen to, yes, I'm, I'm all there. And I think, what's the quote? And it, it's here. It's, so Gloucester says uh, to King Leo, who's kind of baked, no further, sir, a man may rot even here. In other words, dust to dust. Um, and then Edgar comes out and says, what, ill thoughts again? In other words, you're being nihilistic, Gloucester, again? Are you doing this uh, biblical thing? Are you talking John stuff? Are you talking Socrates here again? And he says, he says the key words. Men must endure their going hence, even as they're coming hither. Ripeness is all. And that's what Dr. Dada was saying, is that that's Shakespeare's philosophy. Ripeness is all. And I wondered about that. And what do you think? <laughs> I've come to believe that Dr. Dada was right. So I do think that, yes, that is the ultimate philosophy. And that is the philosophy for our end times. It's the ripeness is all. 
So I must tell you just a, a little bit more. So uh, Maurice Sendak, the the writer who uh, wrote uh, Where the Wild Things Are, I believe that he also latched onto this, and I did find um, that he said in a couple of times in an interview, I'll, I'll just have to read it uh, to you, uh, is, is over here. He says, um, he said, and this is Maurice Sendak, uh, my big concern is me and what to do now until the time of my death. In other words, the same problem that we faced now that we realists and we know things are going to go apocalyptic. Uh, he's wondering what he can do that is valid, that is useful, that is beautiful, that is creative. In other words, not life affirming, the opposite of what these horrible Christians and their John, the, you know, Jesus' uh, gay buddy um, says, you know, all that horrible nonsense from, from them. In, a, in other words, the opposite. It's useful, beautiful, creative in this world. Uh, Anti Christian, in other words, something worthwhile. Uh, and also, I want to be free again. I want to be free like when I was a child. So, yeah, that's me too. Uh, I want to be free of the alien cortex. I want to be free of all these psychopaths that manage us in these end times. Uh, where we just had fun. Hooray. And none of this, uh, you know, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this weary pace from day to day. All this horror that you live in in the state capitalism, you know. I know that everybody says oh, civilization is wonderful out of one side of their mouth, but when they live it, they all say that, uh, you know, if you in polls, Americans say that half, over half of people hate their jobs. So, um, and then look at the opioid uh, epidemic, it's just a, a world of pain and. Yeah, so how many people hate their life, uh, hate civilization, hate this Western authoritarianism and capitalism? The answer is a lot more than we'll admit it. So what I mean by this is that I've had my career, I've had my success. God willing, it should have happened to Herman Melville, who deserved it a great deal more, you know. Imagine him being on Bill Moyer's show, and I think this interview was on Bill Moyer's show. Nothing good happened to Herman Melville. I want to see me, to the end working, living for myself. Ripeness is all, the quote from Shakespeare. Now, interpreting what ripeness is, is our own individual problem. And I think that's it. That's it. To determine what ripeness is, is a personal problem. And that's what you need to discover. So what is the point of it all? Not leaving legacies, but being ripe, being ripe. And that, I think, is the ultimate philosophy. So there is just one further thing to say on that, and that it's only by being ripe that you can achieve ataraxia, which I believe is the normal, noblest form of death, and you can only go through that, get to that through catharsis incubating yourself in philosophy, achieving realization, and ultimately becoming ripe. Um, so otherwise you'll, you'll die unripe. And uh, I think, yeah, the, uh, the unripe is to, to die like a prepper, um, to, to die, you know, trying to fight to the, to, the, to the last with your alien cortex and this kind of desperation. That's a very green way of going out. And the overripe way of you know, is going out rotten, going out like a Hindu or Socrates or a Christian, uh, Muslim, uh, hating the world uh, and thinking that um, you know they're going to get eternal life in Never Never Land. Um, that's also a bit rotten, overripe, um, and yep. So the ripeness is all. But uh, one more thing about ripeness, and that's um, just here again is is what. Uh, uh, Maurice Sendak said in an in interview the ripeness was a letter that John Keats wrote to his brother who immigrated to America describing what it's like to have a peach or a piece of a peach in his mouth so yeah John Keats mentioned eating peaches and eating um, 
eating nectarines uh, quite a lot. I, I might be overstating it, but I believe that he was about to commit suicide and in writing a letter he had a nectarine and just being in the pre present moment and grounding his alien cortex saved him from being killed by his alien cortex, Socrates style. So yeah, John Keats often uh, mentioned a peach and a peach is often about life, love, affirmation, um, yeah, don't don't forget. Uh, yeah, the peach is, is rich with sexual connotation, and um, yeah, always think of Nicolas Cage. You know, I can uh, eat a peach for hours. <laughs> uh, but anyway, and it's one of the sexiest things you'll ever read of how to slow how of how slow you should take the peach. Don't rush it. Let it go through your palate. Let it lie on your tongue. This again is Maurice Sendak, uh, just remembering the letter um, that John Keats wrote. Let it melt a little bit. Let it run from the corners. It's like describing the most incredible sex orgy. And then you bite. But it must be so ripe. It must be so delicious, in other words. You must not waste a second of this deliciousness for which him was life and being a great poet. That you say that every everything that happened, I want to get ripe. So that's what Maurice Sendak was saying. And yeah, the essence of being in a moment, savoring that ripe peach, you have to decide what that ripe peach is for you and what it is to complete your life. Um, and that's it. The ripeness. The ripeness is all.